Hey, welcome back. And I'm always happy to give a talk after lunch, because if people start nodding off, then I don't have to worry about it. It's not me. OK, so can I get a raise of hands? How many people have to work with Enterprise Java in their day-to-day -day job? No one? Sometimes? How many people actually have to use Microsoft WCF? OK, guilty. All right. So the talk I'm giving today is about an integration product that my company created to help enterprises develop their processes better, their IT business processes. And if anyone doesn't know what Access2 is, Access2 is a module that is developed in, in part of the Apache Foundation. And it effectively gives you a management and runtime platform for web services. Okay. What we're going to go through today first is, I have to get this right, some background, because you have to understand the context of the problem that we're trying to solve and how we got there. The approach we took to actually transform from Access2 to, to Mojalicious, the actual conversion process, so anyone who has to work with Java tools day to day, you'll understand some of these terms. If you don't, fine. And then the outcomes that we got from that. So about me, I work specifically in software delivery and systems management. So when you hear stuff like application lifecycle management and ITIL and ITSM and stuff like that, that's my professional domain. I run a consulting company where we're out of Australia and also the United States. And I generally work with clients on the enterprise who are enterprise class clients. So more than 10,000 employees, basically. So some background about what we're trying to achieve here. So large organizations have large systems to manage complex systems and subsystems as part of their business, OK? And there's two major systems that these operations guys need to work with. One is IT change management, and the other is C uh, CMDBs. OK, so CMDBs are based off of SIM, which is part of the D one of the DMTF standards. And change management is basically ITIL process. And what ends up happening is when you guys write code, and you go to dev, and you go to test, and you, maybe you go to perf, and then when you get to pre-production, sometimes you get to even deploy to pre-production. But when you go to production, you have to enter the change ticket. And everyone dreads entering the change ticket because you only do it like once a month or once every three months or something like that. And inevitably, it gets kicked back and it creates process problems. OK, and from that particular change ticket, you get a series of tasks where operators will go off and either run scripts that the developers hand off or they will go and do manual configuration tasks, depending on how much they've matured their automation infrastructure. The problem with this is the process variation between what we do in development and what we do in operations. We're doing one thing throughout the majority of the development cycle, and then we hand it off and do something completely different to get it into the runtime. And that gives a lot of opportunity for error. Another thing is that we have operators doing work that dev has already fully automated. Most of the time, if people are using things like Jenkins or Electric Commander, in particular, we're working with uh, Rational Build Forge in this integration, then dev is, uh, development has already automated this stuff. It's just that operations won't take it into account. So what we want to do here is bridge the gap. We want to test this process early, and that's what this integration facilitates. And in an enterprise-type context, we have a lot of stakeholders that we need to take care of. And all these stakeholders have their own language of how to describe the management of IT. So when we talk about developing web services in an enterprise context, we need to be able to communicate in these guys' language, especially enterprise architects. They basically manage the SOA governance of the enterprise. And you need to speak to them in terms of their language and give them artifacts so they can manage web services across the enterprise. So about six months ago, we were at a crossroads where we were getting lots of requests from our customers about enhancing our service. Something that we really didn't like about uh, Access2 is that it auto-generated WSDL and XSD based on web method annotations, which is, I hate it. I hate web method annotations. And then what the customer would do is take that WSDL, and then they would tune it 
to like uh, to be more specific, uh, for example, data types and cardinality and stuff like that, just so it's better tuned for their infrastructure. We wanted to get away from that, okay? We also got some more requirements where people wanted to fire automations on demand from the change management system, and that's incredibly helpful when you want to do deployments from d in a development environment. And in other cases, we got better vendor, um, we got better vendor maturity, so at the time when we started this integration, these vendor systems that we integrated with were pretty infantile in the way that they exposed their APIs, so that got better. And the worst thing about it is that when we deployed our integration, JWE systems are incredibly memory uh, intensive, and by default, maybe it takes like uh, three quarters of a gig of memory to run it, but many times you have these JWE systems that are running 1.7 gig memory, or even more, okay? So we don't really need that for the type of stuff that we're doing. So when we develop the service, basically that service that you see right there in the middle is a task proxy. So you can have multiple schedulers within your environment. You can have your Jez job in the mainframe, or you can have something scheduled for Rational Billforge. Bill but there's also multiple change management systems that we need to work with, like Remedy and Service Center and um, the IBM Smart Cloud Control Desk. So we had to be able to create a business interface that was very, well, it's a task service that was very easy for these people to understand and integrate with. And just as just a slide, I don't know how many people are into SOA, have SOA certification and so forth. So there's multiple levels of abstraction. This is another thing that I talk about language. When you talk to enterprise architects, you need to talk to them about, oh, I have a utility web service, or I have an entity web service, or I have an orchestrated task. If you just say, tell them I have a web service, they're just like, well, what is it? You know, what's, it, what's the pattern? What's it classified as? So mostly we work at before. We worked at the utility and task level. Now we're working more at the entity level with the rest stuff. I'm moving kind of fast because uh, the timing. So if I go too fast, just raise your hand. So what does it do? So the utility services provide direct API access to these tools that we're integrating with. So for, um, for customers that have Rational Asset Manager, which is uh, informational asset and also physical asset um, type repository, then we integrate with that for informational assets, namely automation projects. So it's like a repository, and we integrate with Billforge, obviously, because that's where automated processes run out of in this particular integration. And then we have the task base, which is really just a few method calls, okay? That's it. And it's very simple, not that many parameters. So why does it really exist? We really want to cut out the process variation. If we can get developers to actually use change tickets to deploy to development, then there's a lot of things that you get for free. You get CMDB configurations, configuration items, you get um, monitoring for free, all these kinds of things. But if you're in a development environment, you're like, why don't I have monitoring? And it's because you're not hooked into these systems, most likely, and you don't speak their language. So if we can get them to automatically execute our builds like in a continuous integration kind of way through a change management system, awesome. We decrease the variation and developers get what they want. But first and foremost, especially for SOA, is that everything is contract first. Things should be developed towards a contract. When we talk to enterprise architects, they care about the contract. They question when I confronted them, hey, we're thinking about changing up our platform. What do you, what do you think about that? And I said, well, as long as we get a WSDL, then we're fine. And then we're like, boom, well, Modulicious, we're gonna, it has no automatic WSDL generation. So we have to do something about that. And I'll talk about that a little bit later. And next is policy. We don't do anything about WS policy, so we'll, we'll work with our customers. Either they develop the WS policy themselves, or we'll help them develop it in the context of their business. But that also, when you look at things like uh, Tomcat and Axis 2, what you get for free is that you even get like the X509 and, and Kerberos for free. You don't get that with Modulicious, so there's some additional complexity there for that. Uh, so content negotiations, something we didn't have to do before. Prior to moving to Mojo, we are completely so, WSDL 
So we had to think about content negotiation and actually retailoring our XSD to be more expressive for those particular constructs that we're dealing with. Some people wanted XML, some people wanted JSON. All right. So when we looked at the old servers, yes, we had the task proxy, the task itself. The task proxy is only for people who needed to schedule across different scheduling platforms the tasks themselves, and then the utility classes. But actually, we got more requirements when we started doing this new version. Um, and everything, I don't know if you can see it yet, but actually, the symbols are different. So these symbols represent West, uh, REST services themselves. And we added a different bundle for automatic execution of builds and deployments, so it automatically fire. OK? So the actual implementation, first of all, our entire deployment scenarios got whacked, all right? So before, we had multiple JDKs that we had to think about. We had multiple application servers like JBoss, WebLogic, WebSphere, Tomcat that we had to think about that customers were using. Plus, we had to use Spring. Plus, we had to use Access 2. Plus, we had to use a lot of other libraries. It was just a complete mess. And every time I went to the code, I just wanted to blow my brains out because I was afraid to touch anything. Okay, but now it's really, really simple. Perl plus Mojo, that's it. And if I want to get a little bit more spectacular, it's not that bad. It's Apache and Plaque, okay? This was probably the toughest part of the transitions because before, we didn't really have to think about WSDL and XSD. It just automatically generated it for us based on the annotations. Plus, we had to move to WSDL 2.0 because Something that you didn't have in WSDL 1.1, you have in 2.0, which is message exchange patterns, which aligns well with the way of how to express REST endpoints, OK? So what we did first is instead of, and it's really bad. I mean, as a best practice, allowing tools to auto-generate your WSDL anyway is not a good thing. So we were able to embrace a better practice, which is writing the WSDL first, writing the XSD first then doing the development. It conflicts a little bit with the, like the philosophy of REST. So the philosophy of REST is allow everything and then start constraining. But um, we had to think in this way because uh, just making sure that we met the customer, uh, what the customer wanted. If we went to a customer, deliver something, oh, it's completely open-ended, they'd be like, oh, it's not usable for us, OK? I like WSDL 2.0 a lot better. I don't know how many people have worked with WSDL 2.0, but the semantics are much better than WSDL 1.1. And we were able to do all the discrete constraints, so the customers loved us for that because we were writing in all those constraints for them. And um, another great thing is that we were able to succinctly describe all of the faults that could be bubbled up from something going wrong down in the, in the entity code. So yes, we had to convert all of our tests. That's actually one of the first things that we did too. Or we had JUnit and JMeter before. We had to convert everything to Test Mojo. Everyone loves it. It's so much fun to develop it. And now that we have, like what we saw this morning in the new Mojo DOM changes, they're going to love it even more. Okay, so it's great changes. All right, so code coverage. Before we used Jacoco, which is like a complete pain. You cannot do any constraints in terms of scoping of what you're actually uh, covering. So if we use like 2% of some third party library, it will come back as 2% and we can't prune that in the reports. Develop cover is really great. We're happy to move to that. Also, moving from ant to module build was a lot simpler because it's, it's just everything is built in there. You don't even really have to think. Our ant script is like 140 lines long. And I'm moving past because I'm getting time checked. Then we're, um, for stack analysis, we use check style and find bugs. We move that to Perl Critic and Perl Tidy. All right, and I talked to some guys last night. Yes, we use the most strict version of it, but we do that for good reasons. So when we transition developers in and out of the project, they have a consistent understanding of what to expect when they go into the code and how they should leave the code. The component conversion was actually the easiest thing for us because we try to be pretty crisp in constructing our classes in Java and um, not really inheriting from uh, cl other classes. So basically, everything was based off object. 
And um, so we were able to transition that. Basically, this, what I mean by this is the component implementation code. So we were able to transition it pretty easy. But the great thing is, no more uh, annotations, all right? I struggle to get under 80 columns when I have to deal with web annotations. It drives me nuts. And so putting it all together, um, then we had to package that, package that into the installer because this is a customer deliverable that they install on their servers, Linux, Windows, uh, Unix, like AIX, and so forth. And, but the cool thing is that the payload is so much less. Before, we had so many dependencies. The installer size, and this is compressed, 36 meg. For just this little, it's a relatively small integration. But now it's less than three megabyte, and that includes like the PDF documentation. So we do additional testing before we ship. So um, we take the interface, we test that into enterprise um, repository managers, like for example, um, WSR, which is the WebSphere service repository system. We have to do orchestration uh, testing, uh, installer testing, obviously, and also documentation testing, which is having people read the documentation, follow the documentation, and do what it says, and make sure that it has the results that the documentation says. So, yep, I'm hurrying. Um, outcomes, some really great ones. So, for, for us, it's the faster and more transparent development. So anyone who's worked in Java or in .NET, it's really nebulous trying to figure out what's going wrong where, okay? And you get like these huge multi-hundred line stack traces and it just drives you absolutely crazy. Um, so you have less complicated product delivery as well, stable and consistent runtime. So imagine all those JDKs, JDK versions, patch versions, don't have to deal with that. Perl 518, boom. Modulicious, yeah, it gets released, released often, but fine, okay? But it's really, really stable. We have better security and core service flexibility, and of course it's Perl, all right? That's a really great part of it. So what do our developers love about it? They love the service implementation. They feel it's completely elegant, and then wiring that up with routes, it's just like, they look at it and it's like, it just can't be that simple. There must be something more to it, all right? Because they're expecting to have all these huge class implementation classes. Um, the user agent is awesome to work with as well, okay? And then get it, fetching stuff with the user agent and then dealing with DOM stuff. I mean, it's just like wonderful. It just flows writing it. Um, so, and the other things you already know about, running locally and so forth. So our customers were um, happy with it because of the much less provisioning complexity. They didn't have to worry about all these different JDKs and runtimes and asking and re-asking if our stuff worked with their particular Java application server. Um, there was uh, less operational overhead because if you look at Access 2, there's a lot of stuff around it and people use probably like less than 5% of it, okay? And when I deliver the code to the customer, it's open and customizable if they want to do it, if they want to customize it. And normally they don't want to because then they have to give me the code to support it and so forth. So, but when we talk about enter uh, enterprise class customers, when we talk about them, they're concerned. They have a couple of concerns. One is, as a modulicious app, how do I enterprise manage that? Okay, and that's a really big question. So we're talking about eventing, we're talking about configuration management, all that kind of stuff that they need to cover off. And they're, um, they are concerned about the maturity and the longevity of the platform because it hasn't been around that long and it's not backed by a large company like IBM or HP or one of these guys. So they, don't, they feel like they don't have that comfort level, that fallback plan if something, if a disaster happens. But, I think that um, as the community keeps on growing, they'll feel a lot better about it. And when they started seeing the outcomes, like, oh wow, I have a much better whistle definition, I don't have to do anything to it, oh my gosh, it just runs, I don't have to think about all this weird side configuration or class loader prece precedence or any of this other kind of stuff, don't have to think about it. So finally, in conclusion, First, Modulicious, it delivers, 
okay? It really delivers on a comprehensive, refined core capability, okay? I, I gave the analogy to someone last night. You get these other JWE systems or these other, uh, like, Microsoft systems, very large systems, but it's like a Swiss army knife with a bunch of dull blades in it, okay? That's, that's really what you're getting. Nothing seems to be really refined and crisp, but we get that with Mojo. I have at least um, found that at delivering product to the customer that it works in enterprise context. The service development in Mojo, because of the way that you go about implementing it and how everything is readily available to you, it actually increases quality. People, when you have people loving writing unit tests, by definition, that's going to help increase quality. Um, the service delivery itself, delighting the customers. Wow, I don't have to like provision this uh, VM that's like a four gig server and two CPU or four CPU. I can have like a really tiny footprint system to run this. And because of this, you can look forward to see us provide and create more Mojalicious based products in the future. And that's it.